Thank you. Okay, look, look where we've gotten. We've gotten to David. And David is unique because God wrote his epitaph. Do you know what an epitaph is? That's when there's writing on a, on a place of burial. Uh, when people are buried throughout all the centuries, whether they're the pharaohs or whether they're normal people, people will write on their gravestone, like my wonderful mother, my wonderful father, my wonderful wife, my wonderful son who died in the war or something like that. They write an epitaph. And God actually wrote David's epitaph. And he wrote it in the book of Acts. And that's what we're going to study. But what he said is, David was a man after my own heart. You've all heard that, haven't you? That's a verse from the book of Acts. David was a man after my own heart. He served my purpose in his lifetime. And basically, David becomes for us the perfect example of what God wants. When God looks at your life, at the end of your life, at the end of my life, do you know what the best thing we could have God say is? That Rodelio was a man after my own heart. And Rodelio did what I wanted him to do. That David serve my purpose in his generation. Now, how do you do that? At the end of your life or right now? Which do you think is better? To start now. See, the important thing is starting today to live like you want to end, how you want your life to end. And I would love for God to say that John fulfilled my purpose during his lifetime. That's what all of us should want. And that's what David did. So what we're looking at is the fifth of our times together, the last one today, and it's God's summary of David. Now that's what really matters. Now in the book of First and Second Kings, you're doing that, aren't you, now? With, with Jim and Chronicles too? Have you noticed that in um, those kings of Israel and Judah, God summarizes their life in a very short way. And what it says is that, uh, that such and such a king, like, and uh, David did right in the eyes of the Lord. Or it will say, Jeroboam did not, he did not do right. Now you, you notice that God, God can summarize an entire person's life in one sentence. They did what was right in my sight, or they did not do what was right in my sight. Do you remember Joseph? We talked about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Do you remember how Potiphar's wife was tugging on Joseph's clothes to commit sin with him. And Joseph said, I can't do that because God is watching. Did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. See, David knew God was watching him. Do you live like God is watching you? You know, it's really interesting. I have been a pastor, a teacher, uh, and, and a lot of other things for a long time. When I was a youth pastor, I used to walk around like this while I was speaking. Boy, it made the kids feel uncomfortable because I was getting closer and closer to them. And I would, I would even, while I was teaching, stand by them. And they would, they would go, why, why are they doing, they didn't want to do anything wrong because they knew I was what? Watching them. You see, most of us, act differently when we don't think anybody's watching us than when someone is closely watching us. You understand? You've all felt that, right? When we see a camera, have you ever noticed uh, in different places they have all those cameras up, surveillance? There's certain things like if, if you're in a place where it says do not climb on the rocks and there's a camera right there, and the rocks are right there, most people will not climb on the rocks. Why? Because knowing someone's watching affects how we live. 
What made David a great servant of the Lord? He said, I always know I'm in the eyes of the Lord. I always know he's watching. So let's turn to Acts 13. And who are my next two readers? Where'd we leave off? Uh, uh, is that uh, Jer no, um, Jerome? I almost had it. Jerome is going to read Acts 13, 22. And then we're going to go all the way over to gold. You get to read more than anyone else. And you get Acts 13, 36. So 22, Jerome, and 36, gold. And what we're looking at now, this, this is a graveyard. Do they have graveyards like that in the Philippines? Uh, they probably have military cemeteries somewhere in Manila or somewhere where all the soldiers are buried in rows. Uh, I think I've seen them somewhere around here, but, but not normal in normal cemeteries. But in America, that's what cemeteries look like. That is a cemetery in America. It's a military cemetery. And I just put over uh, whoever is underneath that, I put over it God's epitaph. David was a man after my own heart, and David served my purpose in his lifetime. And that's what Jerome's going to read in verse 22. So 22. Oh, so after he removed him, by the way, who is the him? Who was before David? Saul. Saul. Why did God remove Saul? He didn't obey him with Agag. And so he said, I found David, a man after my own heart. But what is the end of what Jerome read? Who will do all my what? Will. Do any of you remember what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane over and over again? Not my, but thy will be done. Did you know when Jesus came and introduced himself in his ministry, he said, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of my Father in heaven. The, the servant that God blesses, the life that, that pleases God, is one that wants to serve God's purpose, God's will, not my will. Okay, now we're going to run to gold and look at verse 36 of Acts 13. Wow, David served God's purposes. David did what God wanted him to do. Now, let me ask you, was David perfect? How many of the Ten Commandments did David break? How many? How many? All. Do you ever think of that? Do you know the Ten Commandments? David dishonored the Lord's name, took his name in vain, had something, an idol higher than God, Bathsheba. David did not keep the Sabbath day holy because he was in sin and didn't forsake his sin for a whole year. He didn't confess and forsake it. He was miserable for a whole year. David murdered, you know, well, for, he dishonored his father and mother and then he murdered uh, Uriah by having him killed. And David committed adultery and he bore false witness and he coveted. He did all of it in one event. And David was very, very imperfect. But what did uh, Gold just read? David served God's purpose. You know what that means? You can serve God and not be perfect. So that means all of us can serve God because none of us are perfect. We're all falling short. Okay, uh, now my next reader is going to be Pauline, and she's going to read Revelation 22.3. And she's answering the questions, who is going to be in heaven? And that's an important question to ask. Who is going to be in heaven? Pauline? Verse, uh, 
So all that's left at the end is God on his throne and his servants. What's a servant? Have you ever thought about that? What's a servant? The definition of a servant is someone who does the will of another. They don't do their own will. They do the will of another. And so a servant can be told what to do, and they do it. Most of us don't like to be told what to do. If I said, Gold, stand up, he would go, why? Why do you want me to stand up? But a servant, if you say, stand up, they stand up. Because a servant does the will of another. Now let me ask you, are we servants of God? Do we really want to do his will? Do you know what his will is? Are you every day surrendering to his will? It doesn't mean we have to be perfect, but it means this. Now watch. Remember, I was a youth pastor. I walked all around. This is what I used to show my young people. I said, if this is God, okay, here, this fan is God. No matter how many steps I take away from God, disobeying him, look how many steps I'm taking. 12, 13, 14, 15 steps. How many steps is it back to God? 15 or one? And what's that one step? It's called repenting. The one step back to God is repenting. Repenting means a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. But when I am going away from the Lord, and then I say, no, God, I know that's wrong. And I don't want to disobey you. And I don't want to be far away from you. That change of mind, repentance, takes me right back. One step, and I'm as close to God as it's possible to be. Now, most people don't realize that. And what happens is they disobey the Lord and they disobey the Lord and they stop reading the Bible and they stop praying and they stop serving the Lord and they, they don't, you know, forsake sin and they start getting so far away from the Lord they don't feel like a Christian. Did you know that that is one of the most common things that Christians go through? As a pastor for 40 years, do you know what the number one reason why people came to my office and set an appointment. They didn't feel like a Christian. And what I would, I would sit and talk to them. And you know what I found out as I talked to them? I heard that they stopped, you know, their time of fellowship and their small group and their discipleship, and they stopped their devotions, and they stopped praying, and they stopped obeying the Lord, and they stopped seeking Him, and they started getting more and more enmeshed in their sins, and what happened is they got way out here and God felt so far away that they didn't even feel like they were Christian. And what they thought is that they would have to take weeks and weeks of, you know, kind of begging God, please, please forgive me and take me back. And I don't know if you will take me back. And they go through this process and they think that they've got to earn their way back to God. And God says, no, no matter how far you've gotten away from me, it's only one step back. You repent. And that one step back is what is possible because of the justifying death of Christ. And that one step back makes us, again, his servant doing his will. Okay, real quickly, let's summarize David's early life. And let's go to 1 Samuel 16. So my next reader, 1 Samuel 16. Who's my next reader? Joseph. Oh, Joseph. Oh, Joseph. 1 Samuel 16. And Joseph, can you read for us verse 11? Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. 
Now you all remember the story. Samuel, the last judge, the most famous person in the whole land of Israel, the man that it said people quaked, it scared him when he came to town. He was such an awesome servant of the Lord. When he prayed, God would send thunder and destroy the armies of the Philistines. That's how amazing he was. Uh, he was a very powerful servant of the Lord. So he comes walking into town, to the town of Bethlehem. You know, that's where David's from. And he comes and visits David's father and he says, Hey, Jesse, I'd like to see all of your sons. And Jesse had eight sons. And how many sons did, they, did Jesse bring before Samuel? Seven. And Samuel was coming to, to anoint, put oil on the head of the next king of Israel. And Jesse didn't even let David know about it. And see, what we need to realize is, a lot of us think that if we don't promote ourselves, that, that we're going to get left behind. That's what a lot of people do. They, they think if they don't tell everybody what they're doing and post it online and kind of uh, promote themselves, that they'll get left behind. David wasn't even aware that the king anointer Samuel had come to his house. David if you could just imagine, way off in the distance, on a hill, you could see a speck, a little dark speck, and a bunch of little white bumps. What was that? David and the sheep. And they were way out there in the hills. And here's Samuel. And Samuel has the firstborn come by, the secondborn come by, the thirdborn, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. And Samuel said, Jesse, is this... This is all of your sons? God told me one of your sons was going to be the next king. But none of these you showed me is going to be the next king. Did you show all of them to me? That's what Joseph just read. And what did Jesse say? Mm, there's one other one. See that speck way out there? That's the littlest one. But you wouldn't be interested in him. Did you know that David had red hair? What color are almost all of us in this room, except for Joseph and me? I have clear hair, and Joseph has lighter hair, and the rest of you have dark hair, and none of us have red hair. The word ruddy in English, R-U-D-D-Y, is reddish. David, unlike all Jewish people, the Jewish people have dark hair. They all look like Filipinos. They, they look like they're Southeast Asians or something. And David didn't. He didn't fit in. He had this, he was a big, smiley, red-headed, different little guy. And his brothers didn't like him. And it doesn't appear his father thought very much of him either. How would you like that? To have your dad and your whole family not really think a lot of you. And when the most special day of the family's life. Do you know how many times Samuel visited someone in their home? What's the president of Philippines? Duarte? Duarte? What's his name? Duarte? Duarte. Has he ever come to your house, Richard? Has he been? David? Has David, has he been to your house? No? No? Uh, has he been to your house? No? Yes? No? Boy? Has, he, has Duarte ever been to your house? If he had, you'd know it. And everybody in your town would know it. He probably would come with a bunch of soldiers and a military escort and everything else. This is bigger than the president. This is Samuel. This is God's representative. This was like the greatest day in the history of their family. That, that out of all the millions of people that lived in the land, he comes and sits. Well, he hasn't sat down yet. Remember, he said, I will not sit down. If you read the next verse, if Joseph had been allowed to read the next verse, he says, no, I'm not going to sit down until you bring that one to me. Do you know what the lesson is? David's life was on God's mind. God knew where David was. God knew he was a shepherd. God knew that his brothers didn't like him. God knew that his dad didn't like him. God knew that he had red hair and didn't fit in. God knew that they, they isolated him from the family. If you were a shepherd, 
You could not go to the temple or tabernacle. Do you know why? You touched dead animals. Shepherds would have to, you know, get their sheep and they were involved. If they got killed by an animal, they would, they would get them. They were never in normal society and also they smelled kind of like homeless people. Shepherds live outdoors. They sweat all day long, they sleep on the ground and they're around animals that stink. Sheep smell horrible. When sheep urinate, it goes into their wool and they just smell like a toilet all the time. If you've ever been around a sheep, it smells like a dirty toilet. Everyone knows what a dirty toilet smells like, right? That's what a sheep smells like. And whoever takes care of sheep smells like a dirty toilet. So Mr. Dirty Toilet is out there. They kept him out there with the sheep. He didn't get to go to the tabernacle. He didn't go to the temple. He didn't get to be involved in normal life. He was Mr. Stinker out there. But who was paying attention to him? God. Now what's more important? Have your dad pay attention to you or God? What's more important? Have your brothers think you're great or God to think you're great? See, think about it. See, the first thing about David is he was on God's mind. Now, let me show you. Here's a, it's not a very good map, but this is Egypt. This is uh, Saudi Arabia down here. All the green and yellow is David's kingdom that he turned over to Solomon. That's what he did. David was one of the most amazing kings of all history. In fact, how many people are known by their first name? Not very many, right? David. If you say David and Goliath, I would say probably two billion people would immediately know who you're talking about. Maybe three billion, because all the Muslims know who he is, and all the Christians. So maybe three and a half billion people know him by his first name. There aren't very many people that are known by their first name alone. You know, like Alexander the Great, that's another one. You know, Herod the Great, you know, Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan. Not, not very many people. David was an amazing man. Look at verse 12. Now, let's see. Are, which way are we going? This way? Ah, Theodi. You get 12. And you get to read the 12th verse for us of 1 Samuel 16. Verse 12. And he said, and God came in. Now he was Lord uh, the iron retired of a beautiful continent and godly look. I godly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, and I him, what is this here? Wow. And the anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of God came upon him. Did you know when they sent for David, where was he? Where was David? At the flock. Do you know what that means? He did what he was told to do. He was disciplined. Did you know a lot of people, you tell them, hey, can you go over there and, and stay with the sheep? And if they don't like sheep, and if they don't want to do it, gradually, they start looking at their cell phone, messing around, and they wander away, and they leave the sheep. That's normal young people today. In America, you can hardly find anybody that's a young person that will do their job. They don't come to work. Their parents have enough money, they don't need to work. They don't want to work. And so they're not reliable, we call it. They, they don't show up. David was disciplined. When, when Samuel said, I want him, his family knew right where he'd be. He'd be right with the sheep. Okay. What was David like? Psalm 132, now let's go to Psalm 132, shows us David's life when he was a young man. Now that's, this is the first time I'm letting you see these. Did you know that many, many Psalms, David, David has 141 chapters of the Bible about him. How many chapters are in the Bible? 1,189 chapters. There are more chapters about David than anybody else other than God. Did you know that? David is the most written about person in the whole Bible. We know more about everything. We know more about his childhood. We know more about his teenage years. 
We know more about his working years. We know more about what he said and what he thought than anyone else in history. Wow. Why? Because David is a man after God's own heart and God wants you to know and wants me to know what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad, what pleases him and what doesn't. And David is the most written about person in the Bible because God wants us to see him as an example. Okay, Psalm 132, and uh, we read that. Oh, good, can't wait. We're going to read in just a second here, Rodelio. I have to get to it too, 132. First of all, before you read, uh, Psalm 132, does anybody have anything before the first verse in your Bible? Song of Ascents. What is that? Do you know? Does anybody know? Joseph? Perfect. That's amazing. Are you the one that quoted Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Who is it said their dad taught him Proverbs? Was that in the other class? That was in the other class. How did you know that? You just listen in church all the time? No, I read it in the other lectures. So you're a good student. He's right. You all knew that, right? Because you all are in the other lectures. <laughs> the Songs of Ascent, there are 15 of them. And the Israelites, when they would go up to the feasts in Jerusalem from all over the land, they would stop 15 times and actually sing these songs to get themselves ready to meet with God. And by the way, they also would, would quote them in the steps going up to the temple. These steps are very much like the steps today that are still hewn in the rock that Herod made in Jerusalem. When you went to the temple, you notice that unless I'm really a good, uh, you know, uh, athlete, it's very hard to do these steps with one step. Look how far apart they are. See that? There's the steps to the temple are like that so that you could not just come up without looking. You had to look down because they were not normal steps. They were these elongated steps. And what the people would do is they would come and starting with the first song of ascent, they would stop and there were 15 of those grand steps and they would sing these songs before they went in to meet with the Lord. Do you know what we would say? Wow. That takes a long time. It, it's so long, because we're impatient, most of us, by nature. God says, I want you to take your time to prepare your heart before you come before me. This is one of those Psalms, but guess what? If you read it, as, as Rodelio is going to do, uh, could you read for us the first five verses? You're such a good student. You, no one else has gotten to read five verses. So could you read 132, one to five? Lord, remember David in all his afflictions, how he swear to the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of us. Surely I will not come into the living of God. Of my house, nor I'll go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyes until I find out a place for the Lord, an habitation for the mighty God. And whose resolves or promises are these in verse 1, Rodelio? Who does it say in verse 1, Lord, remember who? Ah, so this is, this is either written by David or written about David. That's the only thing we're not sure about. It's for sure David, but we don't know whether this is written by him or about him. But look what it records, how he swore, verse 2, to the Lord. Do they have a court system here where you raise your hand and say, I promise I'll tell the truth before the judge? You all know what I mean? That's called swearing, you know, affirming. That's what he's doing. David is coming in front of God and saying, I'm telling you, I vow to the, to the Lord God, the Mighty One. What does verse 3 say? What, what Rodelio, you read it. What is the first promise that David made to the Lord in verse 3? Summarize it. Read it and tell us what it says. It's actually all the way through verse 5. It's all connected. I'm not going to go to bed until I do what? Whoa. 
you know what we call that nowadays? Devotions, quiet time, time with the Lord. Do you know what David said? Hey, watch, uh, this, this was the first class. Do you remember this? I said that when I was your age, what would I, I'd put my phone to bed, and what did I put over my phone? Remember that? Did you know what David said? He said, I'm not going to go to bed until I've had my time with the Lord. Do you all ever let a day go by that you don't spend time with the Lord? Well, not while you're here, because you have to, it's on the schedule, right? Quiet time, quiet time, do this, do that. How about in normal life? How about when you're home for vacation, home at Christmas, home after school? How about in a couple years when you're not in the Bible Institute? Do you know what David said? He made a habit in his life that even though he had to be out there with the sheep, Mr. Stinker, living in the hillside, he said, I'm always going to stop before I go to bed and worship and adore and talk to and spend time with my God. David made a choice in his life. And his choice was he would always spend time with God. That's why David was known as the man after God's own heart. David reflected what a servant is. That's why his life is most written about in the Bible. But he didn't just say that. He also says, if you look at verse 9, he said in Psalm 132, look at verse 9, and I'll read it. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. David wanted to be like the priests in the temple. David was kept out as a shepherd, away from his family. But we know what he thought about because David wrote two of the most well-known psalms. Do any of you know what the most famous psalm is that David wrote? Psalm 23. And what did he say? The Lord is my what? What was David? David took the worst job of anybody in his time. The worst thing you could be is if your dad said, you're in charge of the sheep. That meant you couldn't be home. You couldn't spend time with your family. You smelled so bad that your family didn't like you. And you know what David said? Lord, you're my shepherd. I'm one of your sheep. Sheep were smelly. Sheep were dumb. Did you know that a sheep, a little lamb, will die if someone doesn't take care of it. Sheep are so much like humans. If you're an elephant, you can be born the same day you're born. You walk around and you drink water with your little trunk. All other animals, horses, run within moments after birth. What are humans like? You gotta carry them around, change their diaper, and feed them for about a year before they even start doing anything for themselves. That's what sheep are like. A sheep can't even find food for itself. That's why, they have to be, that's why they have to have a shepherd. A sheep has to be shown where the water is or it will die of thirst. A sheep has to be shown where the grass is or it will starve to death. They constantly have to be watched over. They're the, the weakest, dumbest, defenseless animals of all. And what does God say we're like? His sheep. And so David was very humble when he said, Lord, you're like my shepherd. And he said, even though, verse 9, I don't get to go to the tabernacle very much, I want to be like your priest, I want to shout for joy. Okay, in Psalm 132, David put God first before his comfort. Remember, he said, before I go to bed, I'm going to spend time with you. Verses 6 through 8, David personally longed for God. And that meant his life was available for God to use. What did the Lord do with him? Let's go back to 1 Samuel 16. And look at verse 13, 1 Samuel 16, and look at verse 13. And it says in verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil, poured it on David's head in the midst of his brothers, and look what it says in verse 13. The Spirit of the Lord came on David from that day forward. Wow. What happened when you and I got saved? What did the Lord pour on us? Who came to live inside of us? The Holy Spirit. That's how we got saved. 
Have you ever thought about that? This, this, this is an Old Testament picture of salvation. That, that we're, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and lives within us. Now David had come to know the Lord before his anointing. But this is a picture of what the Holy Spirit does that he empowers us. Okay, go on to verse 18. Because look what it says in verse 18. Um, remember I told you that, that what's so neat about God's biographies, that the Lord tells us things we would never have known. In verse 18 it says, then one of the servants, now this is uh, Saul, King Saul is talking. 3,000 years ago, King Saul is talking. Before there were recorders and video cameras and, and cell phones to take videos, we have a video of what happened. King Saul said, do you know anybody that can play very well? Verse 17. And one of his servants, verse 18, answered and said, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of, of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, handsome person, and the Lord is with him. That is the opinion of someone watching David from afar. Do you understand? David's life was an example of godliness to other people. Now, think about this. If someone from your town, your village, your neighborhood, wherever you live, if I went up to them and said, hey, tell me about David, what would they tell me? They would, what they had seen. They would say, well, you know, he lives next door to me. You know, his house looks like this. His car looks like this. You know, he's got a family. Da, da, da. It'd be what they'd observed. What did people observe? Look back at verse 18. What did people see in David's life? They saw that, that he was this, he learned to play a musical instrument. But most of his life, he was outdoors. He probably didn't get to go to school as much as everybody else did because he was stuck out there with the sheep. He was the youngest child. Nobody wanted the sheep. You see, David had to overcome adversity. He didn't get to come to school like you. You guys are here a year or two or three or four. David didn't have all these benefits. But look, he still disciplined himself. He learned to play a musical instrument. He was a disciplined guy, a man of valor, a man of war. He was prudent in speech. He was very careful how he talked. Prudence means cautious. That, that he didn't just say anything that came to his mind. He was cautious in his speech. He was handsome. Remember, isn't it interesting? that We have a physical description. He was ruddy, red-haired, handsome. And the last one is the best. What's the last one in verse 18? That's the best. What was the best quality of David's life? What's the best thing about your life? Did you know that you have something that most of the rest of the world doesn't have because most people don't know the Lord? The vast majority of everybody on earth is unsaved. You have the Lord with you. Wherever you go, whatever you do, for the rest of your life, I used to have a teacher, uh, he was actually the leader of the school I went to, and he said, you plus God make a majority. You know, most people feel very alone, very insignificant, very nothing. You plus God is a majority. That means you, you've got the, the, the greater advantage. You plus God. That means all of us who are Christians have the Lord with us. We're never alone. It's amazing. Well, David displayed true humility. Look at verse 19. Look what happens. And therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the, where was David? Okay, now I want you to think. I know it's late and Marita or Marie, what time is the next, what time is the break? Okay, in eight minutes. What happened when Samuel came to visit uh, David? What did he do in front of his whole family? He poured oil on his head and anointed him what? King. King. 
Now think what that means. His whole family knew that the God of the universe had picked him to be king. Do you know what most of us would have done? We would have said, you watch the sheep. What? What am I? I'm the king. You watch the sheep. I'm the king. What we would have done is, on our bedroom door, we would have put, the king lives here. Isn't that how we think? David displayed true humility. Where did he go after being anointed king? Back out there. See, that's humility. Humility is, our greatness is God, not us. And David, all the way through life, was never proud. We never see pride as one of the things he struggled with. Also, look at verse 23. David's life ministered to others. It says, And whenever the Spirit of God was upon Saul, this was the troubling spirit that God sent to remind him of his sin, David would take a harp and play it with his hands, and Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. David's life ministered to others. Did you know that that's something that is amazing about David? He was willing to serve other people. Uh, verse 15, uh, I love this. This is uh, in chapter 17. Look at this. Occasionally David would go and return to Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. After David was called to be the musician for the king, He's already been anointed the future king. Now he's going to serve the present king. I mean, David was famous overnight. David became the personal musician for the king of the whole country. And yet, what would he do in chapter 17, verse 15? He, he said, hey, I'm, not, I'm still a shepherd. I don't mind going home and so my dad doesn't have to take care of the sheep. See that? He honored God with whatever he did. Verse 20, look, look what it says in chapter 17, verse 20. David rose early in the morning. He got this assignment. He didn't sleep in. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't a sluggard. He left the sheep with a keeper. He didn't just leave them wandering. They'd all die out there. He was disciplined. And he went as his father commanded him. He was honoring his parents. And he came to the army of the camp. Wow. David wanted to honor God with his habits, with his work. Now look at verse 25 of chapter 17. Um, and by the way, all of, we're reading this because God wants us to know it. It's all what he wrote down. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes. And David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine who takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Look at the end of verse 26. That he should defy the armies of the living God. Did you notice that David looked on Goliath a little different than everybody else? David didn't see him as a big military enemy. He saw him as a pagan who was mocking God. Isn't that interesting? He had a whole different view. Look at verse 36. This is all we're looking at is David's life and character. Look at verse 36. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Now look at verse 37. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go as the Lord is with you. Did you notice that David didn't say, I can beat bears, I can beat lions. You know, that's how we would post on Facebook. Yeah, I killed lions. I can kill bears with my bare hands. No. What does David say in verse 37? The Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear. Basically, David magnified 
what God did in his life. It was in his life, but he said God is the one that did it. The next thing about him is in verse 45. David is concerned about the name of the Lord. And David said to the Philistine, this is now with Goliath, you come to me with sword and spear and with javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, whose name you have defied. David wanted to honor God's name. I had a friend once who was in an elevator in a building, you know, an elevator in a big, tall building. And he got on the elevator, and the people in the elevator, one of them said, God, and then he swore. He said the word damn. And he put them together as a swear word. And this man turned and looked at that guy and said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And this guy was smoking. And he went, <laughs> and he said, no one has ever said that to me in my life. And I thought, that's how David was, not smoking, honoring God's name. Did you know we become comfortable with people defying God, dishonoring God, speaking evil of God? David said, no, I I am going to honor God's name. And just a couple more. By the way, when David killed Goliath, David took Goliath's sword, his armor, and all that stuff. What did he do with it? Have you ever thought about that? What did David do with that? Did he hang it up in his room? That's what I would have done. Wouldn't it be neat when everybody, someone came to your room, you say, hey, look. They say, what is that sword? Oh, it's Goliath's sword. I killed Goliath. What did David do? If you read 1 Samuel 21, 9, do you know where Goliath's sword is? Does anybody know where it went? It was in the tabernacle. David took it and said, God is the one that delivered Goliath into my hands. God needs to have this sword. David wanted to dedicate his trophies to the Lord. And by the time we get to 1 Chronicles 18, which you're covering in your other class, David gave all of his wealth to the Lord. And by the way, from David's life in this period of time, David writes four Psalms. And we're gonna look at these in the days ahead. He writes Psalm 19 as he's out watching the sheep. He, he writes Psalm 23 as he's out watching the sheep. He writes about his early life or someone else does in Psalm 132. And in Psalm 101, David tells us his personal resolves in life. And I'll just read them to you. It says in Psalm 101, and let me get these to you. This is what David said. Boy, and I only have 40 seconds. Come on, Psalm 101, Psalm 101. Here we go. He says in Psalm 101, in verse three, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Hey. That's something you should put on the back of your phone. David said, I will never look at anything wicked the rest of my life. Wow. That was one of his resolves. Verse 3. Verse uh, 3 continues, I will hate the work of those who fall away. It will not cling to me. He said, I'm not going to become like my ungodly friends. Uh, Verse 4, a perverse heart will depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Wow. Verse 6, my eyes shall be on the faithful of the land. David had only one life, and he offered it to the Lord. And that's the way he made an eternal investment. And that's why God said he was a man after his own heart. It's time for our long break.